I'd like to welcome you to this Lilly Lecture. Um, it's an honour and a great personal pleasure to introduce this year's lecturer. Um, he's a valued and very well-respected colleague in Edinburgh. Uh, for those of you who don't know the Lilly Prize, uh, it's, uh, I think Nick got his gold medal last year and he gets to give his lecture this year. It's been awarded biennially since 1975. It's the highest honour bestowed by the clinical section of the uh, British Pharmacological Society for those showing distinction over many years in the specialty. And previous winners include uh, our colleague in Edinburgh, Laurie Prescott, uh, with whom and others with whom Nick has worked, like Sir Colin Dollery, Sir Mike Rawlins, and Professor Philip Routledge. Now, Nick, uh, as some of you will know, is a Yorkshireman, so um, he's rather too self-effacing and modest to tell us about all the great things he's done. So I thought I should say a few words about Nick to start us off. Before he came to us in Edinburgh in 1998, he'd had already a distinguished career in Newcastle. When he arrived with us, he re-energised the Scottish Poisons Service. He built up Toxbase as a national and, to some extent, international database for poisons, and he built up a considerable research enterprise alongside his clinical work, including a large clinical trial of a new regimen for acetylcysteine in paracetamol poisoning, which was published uh, in a timely fashion this year in The Lancet, uh, and is likely to be highly influential in simplifying regimens for treating patients with paracetamol poisoning in the future. Beyond Edinburgh, uh, Nick's one of the world's preeminent clinical pharmacologists working in the field of clinical toxicology. Over the last 10 years, he's strengthened clinical toxicology in the UK and beyond. Um, he's one of only five UK fellows of the American Academy of Clinical Toxicology. He was past president of the European Association of Poison Centres, um, editor-in-chief in of the Specialties Journal, uh, Clinical Toxicology, and has also done a fair amount for the BPS. So, so in the BPS, he was chairman of the clinical section, I think from 98 for a couple of years, executive editor of the uh, clinical journal, Australasian BPS visitor, um, honorary secretary, and author of a Royal College of Physicians report entitled Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics in a Changing World. So in, in summary... Uh, Nick's made really major contributions to both clinical pharmacology and clinical toxicology, uh, both within the UK and beyond. And I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate Nick on this prize and invite him to step up to give his Lily lecture. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you for those kind words, Professor Webb. Um, I'd like to say how grateful I am to the uh, society, and particularly the clinical section, for this award, which, as David's hinted, is something of a lifetime achievement for many of us. Um, my thesis this afternoon is twofold, really. One is that clinical pharmacology as a specialty improves patient care in poisoning. And two is that the patients with poisoning are very important, but to some extent underused, and in fact we could say very underused, resource, both for clinical pharmacologists and others, as I will hope to show you. And this talk will have three components, some context to start with, um, some of thing about poisons information and how we treat poisoning, and then quite a lot about paracetamol overdose. Um, so if you've got a headache now, take some paracetamol. Um, the Lilly Prize. This is um, a list of prize winners, as you see, some very interesting and distinguished names on this list. Um, but it also tells us a little bit about the history of the specialty. Um, Ian Stevenson was a, uh, did a lot of work on drug metabolism. Uh, Brian Pritchard, as many of you know, studied beta blockers and cardiovascular pharmacology. But the next two on the list, these two, Laurie and Robin Braithwaite, were both interested in toxicology. And today's audience may find it a little unusual that two of the first two prize winners were working in an area around poisoning. Robin was working on a concentration effect of tricyclic antidepressants, both in dose and in overdose. And there is some history in uh, the specialty of clinical pharmacology that relates to 
drug poisoning and, and toxic effects. One of the reasons that people got interested in the 1960s in, in trying to set up clinical pharmacology, um, something I remember well, but Professor Webb has forgotten, I'm afraid, um, is that people were dying from inhaled use of drugs for asthma from beta agonists. And there was a lot of concern on why this was happening. And this was a problem that um, was a concern. And one of the reasons that, although by the time clinical pharmacology units had been established and been solved, it was one of the reasons that people began to think about this. Anyway, to move on, serendipity in life changes everything. And there are three pieces of serendipity I just want to acknowledge. Firstly, um, in Guy's Hospital Medical School, when I went there as a medical student, I'd never heard of pharmacology. And after anatomy and biochemistry, which included in those issues both just rote learning, this was a, a, a flash of light and delight. Because it was logical, it was simple, at least I thought it was simple, and it was something I could do at last, after two years of misery. And I did an integrated degree in pharmacology with Roy Spector, who'd just been appointed as a professor in pharmacology. He was a clinician. And it was he who, in 1972, came up to me as I was walking across the, the uh, green in guys and said, I think you should become a clinical pharmacologist. It's a new specialty. Fortunately, I went to Southampton, and the gentleman in the middle, who was sitting in the second row, very generously encouraged me. He gave me a job, but he also introduced me to Colin Dollery. And Colin Dollery gave me another job, and... That was the start of my career. So thank you, Charles. I always remember that generosity. The third thing of serendipity was that I happened to catch a tube train with today's chairman in 1997, coming back from an SAC meeting in London. And I mentioned to him that the present incumbent of the Poison Service Director was retiring and had he thought what could be done with this post in terms of clinical pharmacology. And to cut a long story short, a year later I went to Edinburgh And that changed my life again. And most of what I'm going to talk about today is about Edinburgh. So those of you that have got to the age of mid-40s and haven't done very much, I had done a few things before I I went there, but always have hope because things can change dramatically when you least expect them. So why did I get involved in poisoning? Well, when I went to Newcastle, and as David said, I worked with um, Michael Rawlings. I worked with three nights in the first three clinical pharmacologists I worked with. Um, which was pretty, pretty impressive. I don't think they got the nitos because of my contribution, I have to say, but it was very impressive. Um, shows you what a bright gu- group of guys these were. I was lucky enough to work with, actually. That's, that was the truth of it. I, I had to d- d- show that as a consultant, I had something to give to the hospital. And what, what was needed, we had a group of patients who had nobody wanted, and these were the patients with poisoning. It seemed to me logical, having had my experience working in Hammersmith, where I'd met Donald Davies and Peter Bennett, who worked on paracetamol and paraquat poisoning. This was a group of patients we could do something with. I began to work in, in, in that area and collect patients. And we're also interested in adverse drug reactions. There were many parallels coming across dose response in, in, in overdose and in, and in uh, adverse events. And perhaps I should have taken more note of this guy, who's a a very interesting father, if you like, of clinical toxicology. He was a professor of um, uh, initially medical jurisprudence and then materia medica in in Edinburgh. Um, He was a proper clinical pharmacologist. He took the poisons himself. It's true. He took calabar bean, and when nothing happened, he took two calabar beans and nearly died. Um, He... In his 80s, he found he couldn't climb up the mountains of Scotland as quickly as he could in his youth. So he decided he'd try and do something about it and started to take cocaine and measure his heart rate and the time to get up mountains and wrote it all down scientifically and properly. Those are some of the things he did. He's an amazing guy. But what he said was, many persons think it is an easy task to investigate experimentally the physiology of poisoning they're assuredly mistaken. And it isn't, it isn't easy because it took us six years to get 16 patients across Scotland and the northeast of England with quinine overdose. Now, most of you won't perhaps realise that quinine is very widely prescribed for leg cramps, still widely prescribed for leg cramps. But if you take an overdose of it, we're able to show that the larger the concentration in your blood, the higher the concentration, the greater the toxicity. And once you got to this level above about 15 milligrams per litre, you began to get uh, cardiac arrhythmias and death. And at about 10, 
you got uh, blindness. Now it was thought at that time the blindness was caused by vasospasm because the retina went pale. And everybody went around sticking needles into people's necks trying to inject the stellic ganglion, which is somewhere in your neck up here. I'm not an anatomist, but it's tiger country. There are large arteries and other sorts of things there. So it was, it was, it was dangerous, and it was ineffective because the retina is actually directly toxically damaged by quinine, and giving injections to make the blood supply better makes no difference. We also could show from the kinetics of this drug, even in only 16 patients, the treatment used at the time of hemodialysis extracted about 1% of the total body burden of quinine. So a total waste of time. Now we changed the whole management of quinine in about two years, in our own minds, but of course the problem was that people were still reading these old textbooks. At that time, this is how you got the information. You looked at this textbook, a very good textbook in, published in Edinburgh, these are the sorts of textbooks. Or in this, this was the re- registry of the National Poisons Information Service. So when you called up um, about a poisoning, as you did, because this had been established in the mid-60s, people had to sort of scurry through this lot to give you an answer. And this was never updated properly, unfortunately. So by the 1990s, I'm leaping forward a bit here, the poison services in the UK were in trouble. They were getting about a quarter of a million phone calls a year by this stage, but the budget had stayed stable since the 1960s. And so there was basically not enough people to answer the telephone. And people were waiting for an hour, an hour and a half to get answers at busy times. Well, If you've managed a patient with poisoning, and many of the clinicians will have, you can't wait an hour and a half to know what to do. Um, There was a funding freeze, just like today. um, And worryingly... They were people giving different advice in different centres because they weren't all using the same reference. So the UK Health Departments decided, in a fit of pique, to call in, uh, as they said, consultants. And external consultants are uh, interesting people because, of course, they knew less about poisoning than the Departments of Health or anybody else. They were... um, vague individuals, but I knew from my personal experience, my father worked as a textile chemist, and he had been subject to few visits from external consultants by the company he worked for, and he said, what they will do is pinch your ideas and present them as your own, as their own. So I thought, well, in that case, let's give them some good ideas and see what happens. So I wrote in Newcastle three ideas for, or four ideas for the poison service in the UK. I suggested there should be a single source of information, And there was one, but nobody really was using it, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. A more formal network, because it was a bit informal at that time. Uh, Regional structure, so we could get postgraduate education run from those units. And that each unit should also have a different sort of lead role in another part of the service. And by 1995, it already got the Teratology Information Service into Newcastle, which is an important resource about advising women what to do if they want to take drugs in pregnancy or have accidentally taken drugs at dose, not just in overdose, in pregnancy. And that service is still there in Newcastle today. So that was my, uh, those are my ideas. And surprise, surprise, when the DOH published their re- the recommendations, virtually all those are in the report. I subsequently learned that none of my colleagues in the poison services actually submitted any ideas in writing. So um, that was very lucky. Um, Toxbase had been invented by this guy, Alec Proudfoot, who was a physician in the poisons unit in, in Edinburgh, who in 1981 had been approached or knew of money from the Scottish Home and Health Department, as it was then, to develop computing in the health care sector. And he made a bid for a computer-based database to handle poisons information, what he recognised was, as you can see, I don't know if you can read these numbers, but large numbers of entries in that big set of books, those Kalamazoo files I showed you, were duplicates. And they all carried the same information in different ways. And by simplification, you could produce a much simpler output. Now, this was not modern IT technology. This was using something called view data. And the more senior members of the audience remember on Saturday evening watching the BBC football results, something called a teleprinter. Letters coming up on the screen. This is how that worked. So this screen, as you can see, is 20 lines deep and 40 characters across. It's a bit like tweeting 
poisonous information management at the speed of sound rather than the speed of light. But it was a system, and it had data. So paracetamol was a series of about five or six pages that you'd press the button, and the next page would come up. But it was simpler and quicker than waiting on a telephone line for an hour and a half, because you could actually do something at the same time. This terminal sat in the ward, or on the desk of the emergency department. Well, as you know, I went to Edinburgh as David said, in 1998. And I hadn't known, this is absolutely serendipity, in 1996 when I wrote those recommendations, I had no idea I would ever end up in Edinburgh. I thought this would all be done by somebody else. I got there to be told, well, you're now responsible for talk space. Sort it out. This is your idea. You do it. So I had to get that system, which was held in a room which was equivalent of most consultant offices as they were then. It was a huge, great computer. Um, into a system fit for the 1999, as it was, or, or, or 2000, and on onwards. And so we went through a series of iterations of this front page and the software behind it. And most recently, about two years ago, this is now on an app, and if anybody wants it, it's about £5 or £6, something like that. Dirt, it's cheap as, as chips, as they would say, and it contains information on several thousand drugs uh, and how to manage them in poisoning. This has been enormously popular. This database started off in the first year with about 100,000 accesses. And last year it's up to about 650,000 from the NHS. It's also used internationally from Hong Kong to Iceland by different centres. It's the biggest system of its, work, of its kind anywhere in the world. It's been copied by the New Zealanders, by the Dutch, by the... Um, uh, Swedes, but fortunately not many people speak uh, Dutch or Swedish, so we, the only main competitor is the, is, is the New Zealanders, and they haven't got enough money to sustain their system at the moment, so we don't really have any major competitors. Um, the effect on phone calls was planned and managed, and as you can see, it reduced gradually, and it's now running about um, 50,000 a year. The th interesting thing is that this number of accesses to the database, which is about one a minute looks at about 2.3 products, because most people don't just take one drug. So this equates to about 1.5 million data products, sheets, per annum. And as you can see, this is just looking at the usage of talk space and telephones in different parts of the UK, and other than Northern Ireland, which has always been a bit of a mystery, because they haven't got any poison services in Northern Ireland, um, everything else is pretty well about 1,000 inquiries per 100,000 population a year. So about one inquiry per 100 people. Now, why should clinical pharmacology have any relevance to this? This is just technology. Well, understanding what drugs do lets you give better information. We all know, for example, that tricyclic antidepressants work as antidepressants on a primary target, which we believe is the reuptake of monoamines. That's fine. But when you take an overdose, that's not the symptoms you get. The symptoms are all because of these other effects on sodium channels, H1 receptors, alpha receptors, and muscarinic receptors. And also, we also now know that when you become acidotic, as you do, if you fit or get arrhythmias because of this effect, or you stop breathing because of this effect and that effect and that effect, that you then get more effects of the drug on the receptor, because this receptor binding is pH-dependent. So this is basic receptor dynamics, going back to basic pharmacology. Understanding all that is important because when I was a, a junior doctor, we managed, as I did in Southampton and in Newcastle, patients with tricyclic poisoning. Standard treatments were for fits, phenytoin, and for arrhythmias, lignocaine. And the pharmacologists amongst you will realise those are sodium channel blockers, and what we're doing, we're poisoning the patients with more poisons. So this, this, is, this is important pharmacology as well as medicine. And studying the effects of drugs in overdose tells you about the off-target effects of drugs. And that's a message I think we've been rather slow to learn. And we could learn a lot more from. And also it allows you to target your therapeutic better. Now, the whole development of this system has also been, um, I think so popular and so useful because of the way in which it's been written by, by people who work in the poisons units and actually see patients. 
And so we've developed a simple system, and I'm sorry this is rather small, but just want to show you simple colour coding of drugs. So the green are obviously the less toxic than the blue than the red. And we have a structure which is very simple, which looks at the types of the product and how, how it works. It's, it's all laid out in the same way. And as you can see, if it's red, it tells you to ring people up or do things, and it's very clear. The, the most important development, and I'm sure sorry it's a little small, and I should have been more technically bright, and I'm sure the young people like Professor Webb could bring this up into big capital letters, is to actually put nursing guides in here. Because most of these patients initially are called, cared for by nurses. By clicking on that link there, you get a nursing care plan. So the nurses know what to do, what to measure, how often to measure it, what bloods to take, and the patients get better care. So this is interacting with all levels of healthcare members throughout the NHS and internationally. And also, the quinine thing I mentioned earlier, when we should publish those papers, if we want to change this, we type in, in Edinburgh now, the database changes in 15 minutes, and the, the information is live five minutes after that. So when, as I'll talk about shortly, there was a huge change in management of paracetamol poisoning in the UK, Talkspace had that live at 9 o'clock in the morning. That was due to happen. So everybody in the UK could look at it and see what they should do. So if we decide after this meeting we're going to change the way we manage whatever disease you want to mention that's in this database, we can do it immediately. And there's nothing else that I'm aware of anywhere that does things that quickly. So it's a very powerful tool to improve the care of patients at the bedside. I should just finish this section by acknowledging my friends and supporters in the poison service, because this wouldn't have been possible without all these other people, particularly the poisons directors, Alistair Vale, Simon Thomas, John Thompson, uh, who've actually helped us put this all together and, and, other, uh, uh, and actually run it and edit it and, and maintain the quality. Okay, so Talkspace gives us all sorts of data. I could give you a whole lecture on what Talkspace can do, but you'd probably be all asleep by the end of it. But what it does show is what people are inquiring about. And what I've got on here is the top 10 inquiries in the last year, that's 2013 to 14, a financial year, looking at the, in the UK, in Ireland, that's Republic of Ireland, and overseas users. Okay, So these are numbers of... Uh, accesses and percentage of total. In paracetamol, in this case, this is not including cocodamol or other co-products, this is just paracetamol on its own, is the commonest. So 122,000 approximately accessed paracetamol in, in UK last year. In Ireland, similar sort of percentage, about 7.5%, 2% everywhere else. The rest of them are different because of the way drugs are used differently in different countries, and I'm not going to discuss that, but there's some interesting pharmacoepidemiology in there as well. So, it's common. When we look at telephone calls, and these include co-drugs, over the past, whatever, 10 years, these drugs, the paracetamol, the related inquiries, have been at the top of the NPS list for all this time. This is a common drug. Is this surprising? Well, these are the admissions to UK hospitals. And this is not patients who've gone to A&E and been discharged, because if we talk about that, we can, add, we can double all these numbers, at least. So we've got, in England, 113,000 in 2012-13 overdose admissions, of which about 40% are analgesics, the vast majority are paracetamol, of which the UK total is around about 45 to 50,000. It's difficult to get precise numbers. The numbers in Scotland are a bit higher. Um, the Scots tend to self-harm more. It's a feature of uh, the way in which people behave in Europe. It's not just the Scots. The, the Scandinavians and the Icelanders are just the same. As you get further north, people do more self-harm. And the population is somewhat different. Um, immigrant populations behave differently to native populations. It's also related to deprivation, too, and the Scot Scotland's part of Scotland are very deprived. So those are the, that's, the, the, that's the sort of top headline. Just for interest, these are some other common diseases you may have heard of. And you can see there's not a lot of difference between these numbers. So this is a common disease, which probably many of you have never even heard about or thought about. 
When I went to Edinburgh, I thought, well, what's this local epidemiology? This is the epidemiology in Edinburgh at admissions to the Royal Infirmary. And we're lucky that the Edinburgh has only one emergency department, so they all come into one hospital. The population served as a primary uh, resource area is about half a million, so it's a big A&E. And what's interesting is that from, both in men and women, from 1980 to, 90, to, to, to 2000, there's this huge rise in paracetamol poisoning. And if you look here, this is the cutoff for those over the age of 40 above there. These are all young people. So if you were going to do some normal human volunteer work as a, a clinical pharmacologist, this would be your population. So these are otherwise fit people. So this is why this is an interesting population to study from other aspects. Before I get into that in any more detail, I just want to talk about this interesting finding. Because this is the thing that I think, if I want to be remembered by, it's by this bit of work. Because I save more lives doing this than anything else I've ever done. And I'll just explain it. Okay, when I went to Edinburgh, I thought, well, people are still dying from paracetamol-associated poisoning. Why are they still dying? We've got a treatment. What's going on here? So we got the data from the GRO, the General Registry Office from Scotland. And we looked at what we call paracetamol-associated deaths. This is a death in which the coroner or procurator of physical as they are in Scotland say this death has got paracetamol associated with on the death certificate. And these are the causes. So you've got in red paracetamol with or without ethanol. Now, we know ethanol can kill you, but it's not, you've got to drink a heck of a lot. And this is therefore likely to be due to paracetamol. Paracetamol and other drugs, well, it's possible the other drugs may be involved here. And then this drug, coproximal. Coproximal being paracetamol, 325 milligrams, so less than the normal dose, and dextropropoxyphene, an opioid, a weak opioid. So does dextropropoxyphene make you self-harm? Is it, is it psychologically damaging? Is that why this is going on? So, well, we had to answer that question. Somebody in the second row just showed, shaking their head and said, no, well, of course not, but we had to prove it. And so what we did, we did some classical toxic epidemiology. We looked at population exposure, and we used prescription volumes um, for three commonly used combinations of uh, opioid and paracetamol. We looked at the rates of um, prescriptions, and we looked against them, the telephone calls, the talk space accesses, hospital discharges, and deaths. And these were all the same, but deaths were ten times greater with coproximal. So why were they dying? Because as a hospital doctor, I'd never seen coproximal kill anybody. So we looked at where the people died, and the answer was they all died out of hospital. They all died before anybody got to them, before the ambulance could get to them. And were they dying of liver failure? Well, you get liver failure three days after you've taken an overdose. It seemed to me occasionally you might lock the door and hide for three days. But these, this wasn't the scenario. These patients were dying. And the reason they died was they had cardiac arrhythmias because dexprovoxepine is a sodium channel blocker. And we did some experiments in some of our patients and could show this and show that there was a relationship between uh, the dose and the uh, effect on the sodium channel measured on the ECG. Now, that data, together with data on epidemiology of poisoning in England, was taken back to the MHRA. We tried to get rid of this drug before, but this, this time we went back again. And the regulator this time saw sense and decided, because there was, there was no evidence that it was any more effective than paracetamol on its own, no company supported it. And th this is what happened. Now, this, this slide's a bit complicated, but let me just go through it. This is all deaths in which paracetamol is thought to be possibly related in England and and Wales between 69 and 2011. There's a gap because in this year they went on strike and they, they did, weren't, didn't record deaths. Um, so it isn't that nobody died in that year, but they just didn't record them. However, the top line is all deaths, the sum of everything else in which paracetamol is involved. The bottom line here, the black triangles, are the ones which paracetamol and ethanol only. And the, the red line is those in which dextropropoxyphene is involved. And it doesn't need you to be very bright to see this line comes up, stays along, then drops. And what happens was coproximal was withdrawn in 2005 to 2007. Two-year withdrawal because so many people were taking the stuff. 
And there was a huge political uproar. I was, inv- I was aggressively interviewed on one television show telling, telling I was taking this valuable drug away from all these patients who they couldn't survive without it because they were all hooked on it, of course, because it was a weak opioid. Um, anyway, that's saved in England and Wales. Well, you can see the graph there, about 300 patients a year lives. And if we had the deaths in Scotland, which is no the number 50 or 60, that's about 350 patients a year. Now... I think that's pretty good, actually, for not doing very much, but getting rid of the drug. Um, so that was, that's my claim to fame, if you want to give me one. But I also think it's interesting that the, the OTC pack size limitation, and you only buy 32 tablets, introduced at this point, has had, on these sort of data, very little impact. This is argued at great length by statisticians. I'm not going to discuss it in detail, but if there is an impact, it's quite small. So let's talk about paracetamol. The rest of this talk is going to be about paracetamol. Paracetamol, we know, just as a reminder, is toxic because it's metabolised through this enzyme system, creates a, a, a reactive metabolite, which is then normally neutralised by glutathione. If you run out of glutathione, you can't neutralise the the, the, this, this toxic metabolite, and then you make these... Um, systems, uh, c- combination with other proteins that kill, so it kills the cell. This has been known since 1968. Okay. Who's going to get liver damage? And to, do, to know that, we've been using these algorithms derived from a collection of about 69 patients in Edinburgh collected by Laurie Prescott, a Lilly Prize winner previously, not treated. That's the whole of the, the world's data pretty well on that slide. And he got a ruler, drew some lines, and it was as, sim- as complex as that. And we've been using that for the last 40 years, nearly. Various different numbers are used on this line. Some of us used 200. Some of you originally in the UK we used 200. In 1995, um, we found people were dying in this bit, so we put in a risk assessment and brought it down to 100. In the USA, they use 150. This is not an absolute risk, it's a relative risk. Above the lines, you're, you're, you're more likely to get liver damage. Below them, you're less likely. And in fact, the original series, you had to be right up at 300 before anybody died. So it's, it's, un, it's uncertain what the, how best to do this. Everything was going along fine until 2009, and then the, the sky fell in as far as the clinical toxicology uh, were concerned. Because a young girl took some tablets... And this is redacted because it's come off the MHRA's website. She was taken to hospital. There's some, some story about what happened, but anyway, she wasn't treated. She then went back to hospital later. Uh, by that stage, she had some liver damage. She had a procedure from which she died. Um, and there was great distress. MHRA was informed by the coroner, and it was felt something had to be done. So a meeting was convened, committees were convened, and the MHRA and CHM eventually came to a decision, um, and I'm going to describe what happened after this decision. And you can make your own mind up, perhaps. So instead of having two lines, they said we should just have one because it was too difficult to do a risk assessment. These patients weren't reliable enough, doctors didn't have the time, and so therefore this this should be abandoned. Uh, we should use a lower dose to, 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 to take patients to hospital and assess them. And as a, a byproduct, we should also change the way we gave the antidote. I'll come back to that in a moment. And they thought they'd save one life every two years by these changes. Okay, that's what they thought they would do. So we decided to see what, what the impact was. And we had three, three large UK hospitals, one year before and one year after, using routine data sets. So a summary, more patients present more patients admitted, more patients treated. And if you sum all this up and work it out across the UK, it's about 31,000 patients extra treated to save one life. Do the simple maths on a cost per admission, that's £17.3 million to save one life. I spoke to uh, Peter Jackson the other day, who's the chair of the HTA, on, on expensive treatments. This is more expensive than anything anybody's ever considered anywhere in the world ever. Okay? The normal limit's a million. It's what you'd pay for for a traffic uh, crossing. So that's not very cost effective. You may argue with me later. This is Prescott's original regimen. 
It was an empiric regimen based on what he thought he needed in terms of dose of antidote. The acetylcysteine was the antidote of choice they worked on, a, 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 a treatment which gives back uh, glutathione, simply. And it was a big dose in 15 minutes, a smaller dose in four hours, and a, smaller, a, a, a longer infusion over 16 hours. Now, this has been known for many years to be associated with adverse reactions, with anaphylactoid reactions in particular, but not with death very often. Usually when the dose has been calculated wrong with death. Many years ago, in the 1980s, studying patients who had reactions and giving them injections of their forearm of the concentration in that initial infusion, I was able to show these patients had a much greater response in terms of their wheel and flare. And this was not, and this, this just, just to sort of summarise this, this was not due to the difference in response to histamine, but they had a different response to that antidote. And we were able to show later this was histamine release in people. These are patients giving, giving, receiving acetylcysteine, and this was not due to differences in the way we give them the drug. This is a difference in the patient. There was a different patient. We don't know why, but we know that some patients get responses. Now, the MHRA changed the infusion regimen, probably quite reasonably, because they were worried about these adverse reactions. And there were some anecdotal studies from the USA to suggest there was a difference. And that if you gave it over an hour, it was better. And the way we did the assessment of the adverse reactions was to measure whether people got treatment. We didn't do this prospectively, we did it retrospectively on an audit system. And so the patients, as you might expect, they were more in the 60-minute infusion because it was after we were treating more patients. But in terms of adverse reactions, as you can see here in the brackets of the percentages, however you top this up, looking across, there is very little difference in the proportion of patients with adverse reactions. When we look at the odds ratios, there's no difference at all. So this difference in treatment didn't change the numbers of adverse reactions. What it did show is those when the actions were recurring, reactions were recurring based on when people got their antidote. And so with the 15-minute um, infusion, virtually all the reactions occurred within the first 45 minutes. With the one-hour infusion, they all occurred after one hour. And this tells us something about adverse drug reaction reporting because obviously the American physicians never saw this reaction because they'd left the patient. So when you're thinking about this in terms of monitoring adverse reactions, we know that the longer interval between the insult and the reaction, less likely people to, to suspect it. And it even occurs over a period as short as two hours. So we're, we're all fallible. Anyway, that was interesting. What was even more interesting is when we looked at who got the reactions. And we decided to look at this concentration. There'd been data, we'd published data, Stephen Waring had published it about uh, four or five years ago from Edinburgh, showing that there was a relationship between the concentration of paracetamol and the risk of reactions. If we look at vomiting, to take it simply, all these odds ratios really don't go anywhere. So however you, whatever your concentration of paracetamol, the vomiting incidence is the same. So paracetamol doesn't make you vomit. There were suggestions that the reason people vomited was because of the paracetamol concentration. That isn't the case. However, what is interesting is if you have a very low concentration of paracetamol, your rate of anaphylaxis reactions is about five times that of a concentration over 100. So the paracetamol actually prevents the adverse reactions of its antidote. How cool is that? How? I don't know. It's got to be pharmacology, clearly. Uh, presumably it's due to effects on prostaglandin synthesis. But why at such a high concentration? I don't know. Somebody far cleverer than me, the audience can tell me later. So, adverse reactions were unchanged, but timing altered. And we showed a very large effect of concentrations of paracetamol. So the, in, with all good intentions, the MHRA's changes, CHM's changes, cost the NHS 17.5 million, treated a lot more patients with lower levels of, of paracetamol, and many of them had adverse reactions. This is not really a good outcome. This is not the outcome that was intended by this change. It's easy to say so in retrospect, but this needs re reassessing, I think, and I hope it will be. So, how should we give acetylcysteine? 
These are the graphs on the, on the left of how Laurie Prescott gave it. And we thought we could do better. So with Ruben Thanakudi and I plotted how we could do this and, and we did some uh, Monte Carlo modelling. We came up with an idea. 100 milligrams per kilogram over two hours followed by 200 milligrams over 10 hours, per kilogram over 10 hours. Same dose, shorter period, simpler regimen. And we thought this, we could do the study, non-inferiority study, and show the different, show, show the, how wonderful this was. But we couldn't get any money because we needed so many patients to prove non-inferiority, nobody would fund us. And so they said, do something different. So we did this. We did a factorial study using an antiemetic to look at the effect on emesis. We powered the study using ondansetron because this was the best data. And we did a factorial study with four groups, conventional and our modified regimen, with or without ondansetron. Just as briefly, this study shows you the difficulties. Our ethics committee went ballistic, said you can't take retrospective consent, it's got to be all done in advance. I still contest whether that was the right decision, I don't think it was, but it meant that we screened 3,000 patients, 1,500 were possibly eligible, but actually only 360 were actually eligible, and we managed to recruit two-thirds of those, which is pretty impressive at 2 o'clock in the morning in an emergency department that's trying to treat everything else going on. And that gave us enough numbers to get the answer. And the answer is shown on these kaplan myers graphs. So for simplicity, dotted lines and and solid lines. Now, solid lines um, represent the novel modified regimen. Dotted lines represent the conventional measurement. So this is vomiting. So 70% of patients, given that regimen, under this trial conditions, vomited. If those patients are given on downsetron then a lot less vomited. The, vom- the, the, convention- the, the modified treatment, same lot less vomited, and with andansetronic together, even less vomited. So, as expected, andansetron works, but so did modification of the regimen. And for anaphylactoid reactions, we went down from about 28% down to 6%. Pretty impressive. question was, was the efficacy any good? Well, we weren't powered for efficacy. There was no signal that the efficacy was any different, looking at a very small increase in ALT, only a 50% rise in ALT. This is far too small to be sure about, but there's no no signal here. Only five patients got above 1,000, which is the normal marker the hepatologist uses. Um, And we did also look at another marker, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, which also showed no difference. Now, some new data. The graph on the left is the data originally taken in Edinburgh in 1970s, those those nomograms were taken from, showing that as you get injury, without treatment, your half-life of paracetamol is prolonged. This is to remind you of the metabolite we're interested in, this pathway, mercapturate and cysteine conjugates coming down here. Now, we have the opportunity now in our patients from this trial, just hot off the press last week, of the blood sample analyses, very interestingly, in these patients who had such mild hepatotoxicity with a 50% rise in ALT, the half-life of paracetamol is prolonged significantly. The amount going down that toxic pathway is increased significantly. Even more interesting, at first presentation, before they've had an antidote, very soon after their overdose, the amounts going down that pathway are increased significantly. So we know when they first come to hospital who's going to go bad based on these analyses. And we also had some astarcysteine data which basically showed this is, the, this is our modelling, the samples are approximately on the model, and this is what the, the red line is what our model now looks like, and the blue line is what we're now giving as the uh, one-hour infusion, MHRA infusion regimen. Just to, show, just to show you that we, we have a slight difference in the way the profile works. So, to finish, I want to spend the last five minutes talking about how we can better pre- predict liver injury. Because this is the next target. We have all sorts of markers. We have ALT. We know it goes up. We know it goes up quicker in patients who get, do die in the red line. But it doesn't go up quite quick enough. It's not up when they first come to hospital. We know that people who take multiple overdoses don't do very well when they go to the liver unit, and we know people who turn up late don't do very well. 
but that doesn't help us to categorise patients very easily. If you've got renal injury when you come, you don't do very well. Even an increase of creatinine into just above 120, which is the upper limit of normal, a third of those patients die. But renal injury is uncommon, so it's not a good screening test. But it shows you that you can tell that presentation. For some people, they're going to be in trouble. Now, I want to acknowledge at this point collaboration with our colleagues in Liverpool, Kevin Parks Group, because James Deere came back from the States, and some of this work is now much is what he's been doing with us in Edinburgh. Interested in markers, MIA in particular, microRNAs. He worked at the NIH in infection, and he thought this was the answer to infection. And we persuaded him to start looking in patients with paracetamol poisoning. And the rest is history, as they say. So these are specific markers for cell type injury, if I may say so. In patients with um, liver injury due to paracetamol in red here, ALT goes up and MIA-122 goes up, and other markers don't go up. I'm not going to go into that slide in detail because I haven't got time, but basically that shows you in patients with those injuries, they go up. More interestingly, if you take blood at first presentation and then plot that against the ultimate change in ALT, there is a correlation between the presentation blood level and what happens ultimately. And this is for MIA and some other markers of cell injury or cell death. If you plot ROC curves, receiver operating curves, then this looks as good a marker as you're going to get, almost. And these are patients with normal ALTs at presentation. So we can predict, in theory, when somebody comes into the hospital, whether they're going to go bad. Much better than plotting a line which is possibly bad. And what we think is happening, and this is a, a diagram, I, I openly admit to stealing some of these ideas. This is Dan Antoine and uh, James Deere's diagram in a recent paper in, in uh, Expert Reviews. And this shows you the time frame of the time course of the illness and the time at which markers start to come out as cells... A, indicate there's a damage, B, begin to get into trouble and then let loose ALT and then begin to get an inflammatory response and recover. And so there are markers of both injury and recovery or failure to recover of this type. And I'm not, I haven't got time to discuss it in any more detail than that, but that's the concept. So our theory is that when somebody comes into hospital, you can type them into their outcome and then predict what treatment to give them. And like the interest rate or your share of share prices, MIAs go up and as well as down. And actually the best indicator is a combination of MIA-122 and MIA-483. I'm grateful for, uh, to, for, to, to colleagues, particularly Bastian, who's let me publish this in advance of its formal release, to show this, this, this is the best fit we've got so far. Um, in, our, in, in our studies. So this looks as if, if we can get the kit to work in, in a patient group as a commercial going concern, this or something like it is the way forward. So we've come full circle, if you like, from our work knowing that paracetamol kills the liver and just chucking in some astalcysteine to now being able to study this for new markers of cell damage to working out what's going on, which cells are doing badly and well, getting markers here that allow us to target treatments. And in animals, you can certainly stop this process or, or diminish it by giving drugs like cyclosporine or antibodies to biologicals to turn this off so the, the, the cells don't die in the liver. Um, and you can therefore better understand the cell damage and repair mechanisms. And ultimately also know who not to give your liver transplant to because the liver is going to get better without having a liver stuffed into them. So the possibilities are fantastic, I believe. The key thing in paracetamol overdose then is a new treatment regimen possibly. We have to, we have to test it into more patients and I think we, hopefully with the MHRA's collaboration we'll be able to do that. Better assessments of hepatic injury, better understanding of responses in these patients with this type of poisoning, translatable to other poisonings and other drugs, I would suggest, and also translatable to detection of other hepatotoxins. We know that a lot of drugs get killed because they get into man 
and they cause hepatotoxicity. We have the test that may prevent that. This is a simple study giving paracetamol four grams a day, a normal therapeutic dose to people. After a while, their ALT goes up a bit. Hey ho, their, their MIA goes up, but it goes up a day earlier. So you can stop the paracetamol before the ALT goes. Not these patients get ill, but you can see the idea. Earlier, better, more precise markers. And poisoned patients as a drug safety resource are hugely under under uh, used resource. Changes to the ECG, changes to the brain, all sorts of things we could measure. Translational approaches, improved safety signals. And I think huge opportunities for all of us, whatever we come from in this audience, to improve our own specialties using this patient group to inform us about drugs. And with that, I'm going to conclude by thanking many people, some of whom have mentioned the lecture, my local colleagues in Edinburgh um, and in the NPAS, and lots of other people I haven't got time to go over. Thank you to you all for listening. And uh, that's a picture of some of us, and that's my email address if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you.